Welcome back, everyone. Now that we're all revitalized and rejuvenated with our lunch and our wonderful victory bells, it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Rob Havers, who I doubt has ever had such a lovely opening act as the victory bells, <laughs> is the executive director of the National Churchill Museum and the vice president of the Churchill Institute at Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri. Dr. Havers arrived at Westminster as a visiting Fulbright Robertson professor of British history back in 2003. Previously, he was a senior lecturer for the Department of War Studies at Sandhurst, and he's taught at the London School of Economics and Political Science. He holds a PhD from Pembroke College, University of Cambridge, and a master's degree from the London School of Economics and Political Science at the University of London. His books include Reassessing the Japanese POW Experience, the Chanji POW Camp, 1942 to 45, which is a revised version of his PhD thesis, Sherborg, 1944, The Falklands Conflict, 20 Years On, and the Second World War, 1939-43. He is here to discuss Churchill's March 1946 speech, the sinews, of, the sinews of Peace, delivered at Westminster College, just a stone's throw away from his office. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Rob Havers. Well, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to you. I'm not sure how I managed to draw the short string to follow the victory bells, <laughs> but, I, uh, but I will do my very best to, to entertain you in some fashion. Um, as Keith said, my name is Rob Havers. It's the, uh, I have the honor and the pleasure to be the director of the National Churchill Museum. This is my first visit to the National World War II Museum here in New Orleans. Uh, it is as impressive as I had been led to believe. Um, a very impressive uh, organization indeed. My thanks to the World War II Museum and to the New Orleans chapter of the Churchill Center who work like so many groups and individuals around the country to keep the memory, the legacy of Sir Winston Churchill alive, a need that seems to me to grow daily. I'm sure that most audiences, but perhaps not this one would wonder why it is that there is a Churchill Museum located in the middle of Missouri and on a college campus. The answer, of course, is bound up in the nominal title and topic of this presentation, that of Churchill's Iron Curtain Address. For it was to Westminster College in the spring of 1946 that Winston Churchill journeyed to deliver what would probably become one of the most significant, the most substantial speeches of his long and illustrious career. A speech that Winston Churchill himself claimed within hours of its delivery that this was my most important speech. So what I'm gonna try and do today is fill in a little of the detail of how it was that Winston Churchill came to Westminster College to deliver that speech look at the background to the invitation, and spend some time examining why it was exactly that Churchill was advocating what he did in that address. Think, too, about why it made the impact that it did do, and lastly, suggest why and how this speech perhaps helped recast Churchill's reputation in the United Kingdom, most certainly, but perhaps especially in the United States. And then finally, perhaps somewhat speculatively, to think about what it did for Churchill's reputation whilst he lived, but also what it amounted to in terms of cementing elements of the popular idea of who Churchill is and why his legend persists and lives on today in the fashion that it does. Winston Churchill, as I'm sure we can all agree, most certainly knew a little bit about delivering great speeches, delivering great addresses, earth-shattering speeches. 
speeches that had the power to inspire people, to inspire nations, people to be inspired to do more than they thought they were capable of, to do what they thought, in fact, they were incapable of. The examples from his career are legion. We shall fight them on the beaches, never in the field of human conflict with so much owed by so many to so few. Even a cursory examination of the strengths and the weaknesses of the German and British forces in the spring and summer of 1940 as the Battle of France ended and the Battle of Britain began indicated that this was a David and Goliath struggle. Churchill's words alone, of course, while not insignificant, did seemingly engender a determination, a spirit of resistance. Churchill's turns of phrase his distinctive modes of inflection and delivery and word choice have all in many ways stood the test of time. Indeed, still maintain, still possess the power to move, to inspire, even to this very day, even when lifted from that necessary historical context within which they were conceived and delivered. Winston Churchill, after all, had spent a lifetime honing his craft, honing his delivery, his pace, his meter, his content. All are well captured in those addresses that I've cited. They stand out even today in a world where such rhetorical skill is less prized than ever, but also, also crucially stood out at a time when great orators were commonplace and those skills in the tempestuous cauldron of British parliamentary politics were also something of a prerequisite for any modicum of political success. Churchill famously, of course, devoted an average of an hour per minute of delivered speech. He knew the power of words. He knew the power of words intimately. Knew what the right words delivered in the right place and at the right time could ultimately achieve. Now the events that led to Winston Churchill's appearance in Fulton, Missouri, of all places, stretch back nearly a year from that cool day in March 1946. On May 7th, Nazi Germany had surrendered to the Allies. Adolf Hitler had shot himself just days previously. The nightmare of the Second World War, in Europe at least, was over. Although the war against Japan would rage on for three more months, VE Day on the 8th of May, Victory in Europe Day was a celebration. At the center of it all was the man who had been at the center of that war. That same day, Winston Churchill drove to the Ministry of Health building and gathered with members of his wartime coalition on the balcony. He addressed the joyous crowd arrayed in front of him. As ever, Churchill's words matched the historic occasion. He said, this is your victory. God bless you all. This is your victory. It is victory in the cause of freedom in every land. In all our long history, we have never seen a greater day than this. Every man, woman has done their best. Everyone has tried. Neither the long years, nor the dangers, nor the fierce attacks of the enemy have in any way weakened the tremendous resolve of the British nation. God bless you all. Famously, after Churchill's invocation of the phrase, this is your victory, the crowd roared back, no, it is yours. The plaudits, of course, were well deserved. Rarely has the role of one man been central in such a major undertaking as the Second World War. As Max Hastings recently noted in his exposition of Churchill as war leader, he said that Winston Churchill gave us a standard of leadership against which all leaders will be judged forevermore.
a hard act to follow indeed. Churchill basking in the glory of what was in so many ways his victory certainly had a right to think that the future was bright politically. His hopes, however, of maintaining that wartime coalition of labor and liberal and conservative into the post-war period were cruelly dashed. Following the Labour Party conference of May that year, Clement Attlee, the Labour leader, the Deputy Prime Minister, formally told Churchill that he and the Labour Party would no longer serve in a coalition government, and that a general election should be held as soon as possible. Churchill acquiesced, reluctantly. He had hoped to maintain that coalition, that spirit of collaboration, at least until the war against Japan had been concluded successfully. Perhaps Churchill, too, harbored hopes of maintaining that coalition post-war, as David Lloyd George had done after World War I. But with those hopes seemingly dashed, Churchill tendered his resignation to the king, who then asked Churchill to serve in a caretaker capacity, until the election had resolved appropriately and decisively who it would be that would govern Britain in the new post-war period. Polling day for that election was set for 5th of July. The final result not known until several weeks later, until the 26th of July. The delay explained by the need to count and to marshal the many ballots of British servicemen and women overseas. The final result, one of the most dramatic in British electoral history. Winston Churchill, the victor of World War II, the man who had become the very personification of Britain's resolution, Britain's determination to fight on, incredibly had lost. Churchill and the Conservatives had been defeated. The Labour Party had won. Clement Attlee, the Labour leader, Churchill's wartime deputy, was Prime Minister. He duly replaced Churchill at the negotiating table at Potsdam. It was soon apparent that the scale of the victory for the Labour Party was massive. Labour received nearly 12 million votes, 393 parliamentary seats, a massive gain of 239 seats, easily enough to maintain and command a huge majority in the 640 seats House of Commons. The Conservatives, by contrast, won just 213. For Winston Churchill himself, this was a terrible blow, a personal blow. He was devastated. How could he not be? Clementine bravely tried to console the great man, famously commenting on the defeat that it may well be a blessing in disguise. Winston could only reply, at the moment, it seems quite effectively disguised. <laughs> In the immediate aftermath of the election defeat, Churchill said to one of his wartime secretaries that it had been his earnest wish, in having won the war, to lead the peace too. In this, he was to be disappointed. An apocryphal story, quite possibly, that circulated around this time was that King George VI offered Winston Churchill the Honorable Order of the Garter, an ancient chivalric order. Churchill declined this consolation prize, commenting, why should I accept from my sovereign the order of the garter when his people have already given me the order of the boot? How then could this apparent about face have come about? How could Winston Churchill, the personification of resolution and determination in wartime, be apparently so surplus to requirements in peacetime? The answers to this are several and quite well known. Churchill himself and the Conservatives ran a profoundly dull electoral campaign. Churchill seemed to believe, not unreasonably, that his popularity as wartime leader and massive personal appeal would suffice and translate into a win at the polls. In many of his public appearances, he was roundly cheered, but for what he'd done in war, not in peace. <laughs> 
Churchill also made several dire missteps in the election campaign. On the 4th of June, quite early on in the campaign, he delivered a nationwide election broadcast to the British people. The firm grasp of what the people needed and wanted to hear, so apparent in wartime, had deserted Churchill. Churchill had said during the war that the, he had had the honor to provide the roar of the British lion, that the sense of what the people needed and wanted to hear was his. That was now gone. Inexplicably in this broadcast, Churchill criticized the Labour Party in strident terms. Labour's electoral promises, he said, were so far reaching, so dramatic in scope and intent that Labour would need to fall back on some type of Gestapo to see them realized. For Churchill to lambast his former wartime comrades in such vociferous terms to invoke the fearsome Gestapo emblematic of all that Churchill and Labour had fought against struck a discordant note with the British people. While there's very little evidence to suggest that this speech persuaded people to vote against Churchill or to change their preferences, it seemed to confirm that Churchill was ill-suited to lead the peace. The Gestapo speech, as the episode became known infamous, infamously as, harmed Churchill's reputation. Churchill's own daughter, Sarah, understood why her father had tried to draw what seemed such an inexact, crude parallel. But she also noted this. Socialism, as practiced in the war, did no one any harm, and quite a lot of people, a lot of good. The children of this country have never been so well fed or so healthy. What milk there was was shared equally. The rich didn't die because their meat ration was no larger than the poor. And there is no doubt that this common sharing and feeling of sacrifice was one of the strongest bonds that unifies us. So why, they say, cannot this common feeling of sacrifice be made to work as effectively in peace? Sarah added a postscript to this note to her father. Please don't think I'm a rebel, she said. Where then did this leave Churchill? An MP, of course, still. Leader of his party, leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition, His Majesty's loyal opposition. So when Winston Churchill journeyed to Westminster College in the spring of 1946, it was somewhat of a pensive world that held its breath for what he might deliver on that stage in the hastily converted gymnasium that still stands today with very little real alteration. So the first part of this curious conundrum and perhaps the piece which is least well known is how was it that this great statesman ended up at Westminster College in the heartland, for want of a better term, of the United States. Westminster College is a typical small classic liberal arts institution founded in 1851 and when Winston Churchill visited there in 1946 probably had 300 students an all-male institution the lecture or lecture series for initially he was asked to deliver more than one was the John Finley Green lecture then as now Westminster College's most prestigious lecture and named for a St. Louis alumnus and lawyer, John Finley Green, and established by his English-born wife in 1936. Winston Churchill received the invitation to visit in the autumn of 1945. There is a copy at the National Church Museum. The original now resides at the Churchill College Archive Center in Cambridge. It was a fairly standard missive in many ways. It detailed the origins of the lecture series, how it was established to support an individual of international repute who would discuss economic, social, or political problems of international concern. I'm not sure if you can see that, but this is a facsimile of the original invitation. Initially, as I said, the letter suggested two or more lectures one in Fulton, 
one in St. Louis, about an hour and a half to the east of Fulton, Missouri. With all these considerations being mentioned, there was, however, something more significant at the bottom of this invitation, something that made it hard for Winston Churchill, so recently Prime Minister, still with a message to deliver, made it hard for him to ignore. Written in reasonably legible handwriting, and you can see it, I hope, is a personal note from President Harry Truman, Missouri's own president, born and raised 160 miles to the west of Fulton in what was then the small town of Independence, now a, a suburb of the Kansas City metro area. What did this handwritten note say? It says quite simply, this is a wonderful school in my home state. Hope you can do it. I'll introduce you. Best regards, Harry Truman. The process by which this handwritten note appeared on the bottom of the invite, on the bottom of the letter, was not pure luck, of course. The president of Westminster College, a man named Frank McClure, and a graduate of Westminster himself, had a Westminster classmate called Harry Vaughan, Major General Harry Vaughan, a, a military aide to President Truman. It was he who persuaded Truman to add this handwritten note to the invitation. Churchill knew, of course, to be introduced in the heartland of America by the incumbent president, the eyes of the world would be upon him. Anglo-American unity would be seen again personified on that stage. Churchill, a man who understood notions of symbolism. Churchill's sojourn in the United States in 1946 was like many of Churchill's times abroad, an elongated one. Partly at the behest of his doctor, Lord Moran, Churchill took, uh, sought time in the sunshine. He visited the home of a Canadian colonel, Frank Clark, in Miami. He painted, he enjoyed the sun, he also availed himself of the opportunity to visit Cuba, courtesy of an aircraft that President Truman had laid on at his disposal. The visit to that island of Cuba, of course, marked a return more than 50 years after Churchill had spent time on attachment with the Spanish military in 1895. As it turned out, the small airport at Fulton could not accommodate an aircraft large enough to fly the presidential party. So Churchill and Truman took the somewhat unusual step of traveling together by train from Washington, D.C., across the country, disembarking at Jefferson City, the state capital, and driving the short distance north, 20 miles or so, to Fulton. Another apocryphal story suggests that as they entered the city limits of Fulton, Churchill asked the driver to pull over, and he removed a cigar from the inside of his jacket and said, the people will be expecting this. <laughs> he was probably right. Churchill's speech that day at Westminster College was a momentous one, full of the towering rhetoric that we all associate with Winston Churchill. Churchill at the height of his powers, laden with poignant imagery and serious messages. He began the speech in typically Churchillian joviality, noting as if he could hardly ignore the fact that I am so glad to come to Westminster College this afternoon and I'm complimented that you should offer me a degree. The name Westminster is somehow familiar to me. I seem to have heard it before. Indeed, it was at Westminster that I received a very large part of my education in politics, in dialectic, in rhetoric, and one or two other things. In fact, we have both been educated at the same or similar, or at any rate, kindred establishments. Churchill certainly had a specific point to make when he delivered his address. He had commented to Truman early in the new year 
of 1946, as John Ramsden notes very well in his wonderful book, Churchill, Man of the Century, that I have a message to deliver to your country and to the world. Truman had responded with an equally emphatic comment, I know you have a real message to deliver at Fulton. The formal title of this speech, although universally and generally known as the Iron Curtain Address, was of course the sinews of peace. Well, what did Churchill say in this speech, one of the longest of his career? Firstly, that the United Nations was an organization that he believed could command respect. It wasn't a new iteration of the League of Nations, something that could exert an influence in the post-war world, but also pragmatically and realistically an organization that needed teeth. Churchill talked about the need to have sheriffs to ensure compliance with its direction. Back home in the United Kingdom, in Britain, the apparent bellicose tone in some of Churchill's comments simply reinforced to the British electorate that they had been quite right in turning Winston Churchill out of office in 1945. Here, once again, was that man of war, not that man of peace, acting to form. In warning, as he did, of what he considered to be the threat posed by Stalin and communism at Westminster, Churchill essentially battled some very deep-rooted preconceptions. Firstly, he was known as an implacable opponent of Bolshevism. Famously, he commented on the need to strangle Bolshevism at birth after the Russian Revolution. He was also facing the uphill struggle, the difficult task of recasting years of pro-Russian, pro-Stalin propaganda. The Soviet Union, the Red Army, even Uncle Joe Stalin, were heroes to the British people. British wartime propaganda, in particular, had made much of the heroic efforts of the Soviet Union in resisting Nazi Germany and lauded appropriately their struggle. Churchill had faced this very issue when campaigning in 1945. Notions of the grandeur, the achievements of communism, with its ethos of shared endeavor, so widely felt in Britain during the war, had helped ensure that when Churchill warned on the dangers of what the Labour Party would do when they came into office, many in Britain didn't share those concerns. They fell on deaf ears. Winston Churchill, of course, as Prime Minister, was privy to much secret intelligence about the Soviet Union. He was under no illusion about the type of monster that Uncle Joe Stalin really was, really was, excuse me. He was aware of the life, uh, the reality of the Soviet Union. To the British people though, knowing only the wartime propaganda of Stalin's warnings, uh, wartime propaganda image of Stalin, warning of communism seemed only to be a weak-willed political gambit designed to restore a pre-war order that very few in the UK hankered for. The money shot of Churchill's speech of this address, of course, is that immortal line when Churchill talks about an iron curtain having descended across the continent and drops his left hand to indicate the bisection of that, of that continent. He said, behind that line lie all the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe, Warsaw, Berlin, Prague, Vienna, Budapest, Belgrade, Bucharest, and Sofia. All these famous cities and the populations around them lie in what I must call the Soviet sphere, he said. What, of course, has always struck me as curious is that the line that Churchill anticipates so well about the actual division of Europe doesn't actually happen until three years later in 1949. Uh, because if you look at the map in 1946 and trace a line from uh, Trieste, from Stettin to Trieste, Germany is on the west side of that line. Berlin is on the west side of that line. 
Well, whether that is another example of Churchill's seemingly myriad examples of being terribly prescient, or simply that he confused his Eastern European geography, we shall perhaps never know. Churchill, as so often in his storied career, did not originate the term Iron Curtain. It's got a much longer history. There's a great book written on that very phrase. Grounded, of course, in the device developed at the end of the 19th century to uh, preserve audiences from fires in theatres. Interestingly, it had been used fleetingly at the end of the First World War uh, to describe a similar concern about Bolshevism and the division of Europe. Curiously as well, Joseph Goebbels, in some of his last broadcasts as Nazi Germany collapsed around him, also invoked that term. There's a great quotation, in fact, in, in Paul's book where he talks about Goebbels saying, nobody seems in England to recognize the fact that once the Soviet Union is in, Engl is in Europe, it will be a much greater opponent of the British Empire. Goebbels, of course, was speaking to that long-held dream quite current in Germany as she faced the Western Allies and the Red Army approaching from both directions. The notion of a separate peace with the Anglo-Americans and a resumption of the conflict with the real enemy, the communists, the Bolsheviks. Churchill, though, talked a great deal about the role of a special relationship between the United States and the British Commonwealth and how that would not be inconsistent with the U new United Nations organization. Churchill, too, in this great performance at Westminster College, seemed to have recovered that deft political touch that he appeared to lose so conclusively during his time in the 1945 general election, characterized as that campaign was by his Gestapo speech comments. When we opened the National Church and Museum's new exhibition a few years ago, I had the honor of showing Lady Mary Soames around, and we watched the film that talks about the election defeat. And Mary Soames said to me then, my father had spent, and this was an explanation of how he could lose the election, she said, my father had spent five years being a leader. And when the election came around, he had forgotten how to be a politician. And I thought that was a wonderful characterization of probably what had happened. At Fulton, Churchill asked his audiences to look back beyond the war that had just finished to the interwar years when he warned of the threat posed by Hitler. He said at the time, last time I saw it all coming and I cried aloud to my fellow countrymen and to the world, but nobody paid any attention. There never was a war in all history easier to prevent by timely action than the one that has just desolated great areas of the globe. It could have been prevented without the firing of a single shot, but no one would listen, and one by one we were all sucked in to the awful whirlpool. We must surely not let that happen again. Despite much ambiguity about who knew what and how much, it now seems to be a matter of record that Truman knew precisely what Churchill would say in Fulton. That Attlee, Prime Minister back in London, also knew the tone, the tenor of what it was that Churchill would describe. Certainly, a more rust, robust approach from the State Department was already in evidence. And the long telegram about Soviet intentions predated Churchill's ideas by a couple of months. Although both Truman and Attlee had room to deny plausibly that they knew what the full impact of the speech was. Churchill's ending, proposing that the British Empire and Commonwealth joined with the United States to provide an overwhelming assurance of security, alarmed many, not least Joseph Stalin, who issued a blistering response in Pravda amongst other state organs. When Churchill arrived in New York a few days later, he confirmed publicly that when I spoke in Fulton, I felt it was necessary for someone in an unofficial position to speak in arresting terms about the present plight of the world. Events over the next few years showed him to be 
more correct than not. In 1949, Germany was formally divided, and with it, Europe, into two armed camps. The Cold War that would follow would define the nature of international relations for the next 40 odd years. The next general election in Britain in 1950 saw only the narrowest of Labour victories, with their number of seats dropping to 315 and the Conservatives rising to 282. Division within party and over defence spending in the Korean War helped explain this apparent reversal. But the narrow nature of the election win meant that Attlee felt he needed to clear a mandate from the British people, and another election was held in October of 51, and now Churchill and the Conservatives triumphed, with Churchill becoming Prime Minister once again, and for the first time, courtesy of a general election. Curiously, and as again as a result of the first party, uh, first past the post system, the Labour Party actually secured uh, more votes but lost the election. Churchill, having won this election in 1951, did very little to reverse what it was that the Labour Party had put in place. It was only in the 1970s with Margaret Thatcher did many of those central shibboleths of British post-war policy uh, get reversed conclusively. How then does this speech at Westminster College in 1946, how does it help create and maintain the notion of Churchill the statesman? Well, firstly, it allowed him almost immediately to capitalize on newfound freedoms, to speak as he noted as a private person, and free in some sense from the fetters of party, because Churchill was never a party politician. Churchill, despite the considerable raft of complaints from Americans in particular, uh, and John Ramsden's book again lists the many comments and criticisms that the British Embassy received from Americans talking about Churchill trying to drag the US into another conflict. Churchill recast his role as an international statesman beyond party politics in a decisive fashion. It also struck me, and this is the speculation I alluded to earlier, that in some sense Churchill's appeal to American audiences was sealed by this address. Not created necessarily by his stirring speeches in World War II, they certainly did a lot of that, but rather the thrust of his comments allied perfectly with US policy and direction in the post-war world. Post -war world. On that long train journey with Truman to Fulton, Missouri, Churchill noted that if he were to be born again, he would like to be born American because of the endless sense of possibility that this country held. And I think in many respects, the Fulton speech helped mark him out as that Anglo-American far more in many ways than the war years did. I have a few images at the end here of the National Churchill Museum, if you'll indulge me, To commemorate Churchill's visit, Westminster College brought a Christopher Wren church from London in the 1960s and rebuilt it. We also have eight sections of the Berlin Wall created by Edwina Sands. And as a wonderful image of the church. And underneath, an interactive exhibition that explores and discusses Churchill's life and times and does our best to bring Churchill to new generations. Many people say to me, that Winston Churchill is a dead white British politician who can have very little relevance to Americans today. I think, if anything, the legacy and the opportunity to remember Winston Churchill exists better in this country than anywhere else because Churchill's optimism is so very American. And it's a pleasure to lead an organization in this country that does just that. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We'll start in the center, Dr. Havers. Speaking of the Wren Church, um, when I had the privilege of visiting you guys about five years ago, I marveled at it. And so my last visit to London about this time last year, 
I went in search of the original location, which is, of course is now a park with a lovely um, plaque saying the original church is in Fulton, Missouri, and, a, and there was a sticky note next to it, and we want it back from some passing person in London. Uh, uh, no. Sorry. Yeah, uh, they're not getting it back. What I was curious about was uh, the connections the museum still has, uh, having moved the church with the actual city of Westminster in, in London, and sort of that, and also, if you could comment um, on the calls that happened this last week and mention the museum in Fulton of a National Churchill Memorial in Washington using that and arguing exactly what you said, that here in America, this half American British po uh, politician should have a, a monument in DC for this, right. quoting what happened at Westminster. Right. The, um, the church actually comes from, uh, it came from a part of London, the city of London, so it was with the Diocese of London that the arrangement was made, and the church was badly damaged in World War II and, uh, and had lain derelict for 20 years, so there was no real plans to rebuild it. And of course, as, as you're well aware, the city of London is banking and offices, and so the original um, congre there was no congregation even had they rebuilt the church. So I think the Diocese of London, in a very pragmatic British move, were quite happy to see it move to, to Westminster College and to see it reborn in, in a fashion that uh, it's appreciated in, in, in the heartland of America in a way that it would not have been in London. And as you know, if you visited the site, it's hemmed in now by these Japanese banks and all the rest of it. So um, I, 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 did see, I did see that piece about the, the, the sculpture or the, the statue in, uh, in Washington, D.C., and I don't think that is inappropriate, inappropriate because, as I said, and I, I never realized this until I, obviously, this is my Arkansas accent I'm speaking with, but um, uh, as, a Brit, as a Brit in America, I hadn't realized how Churchill is revered in quite the fashion, and at the International Churchill Conference a couple of years ago, I spoke on this very fact, and I think it's partly because the the British do not embrace heroes, and are, are they're unwilling to be inspired by heroes, unlike Americans. And Churchill understood that, and he played on that for good good reasons. Um, but Churchill was very American in many ways. He's half American, but his optimism, his can-do spirit. It's just terribly American. And I think it, it's easier to be a prophet. Um, a prophet is always without honor in his own land. So I think having Churchill, the legacy of Winston Churchill can live on in a more dynamic fashion in this country, whether it's in Fulton, Missouri, or in DC. I think the opportunity exists considerably. Um, I cannot say that there are groups like this uh, Churchill societies around Britain who gather with the passion and fervor that I've seen across this country. Do you think that Churchill, before his death, at any time realized the extent of his, what his legacy would become, uh, had any thoughts of that, and would have even thought that we would be meeting here today in such a fashion? Uh, <laughs> I'm sure he would have been delighted to know that, that we would have been meeting today. And I'm sh I, I don't know. I, I, the, Churchill is a terribly good self-publicist, as I'm sure we would all agree. And uh, although the, he, he actually didn't actually say, um, history will be kind to me, for I intend to write that history, he, he had a strong sense of uh, an eye on posterity. Um, whether he thought he would be remembered in quite the fashion dynamic fashion than he is today, I, I don't know. This is a personal comment and, uh, and it's speculation. I, can't, I think possibly we're so bereft of great leaders that we're possibly looking to men like Churchill and his stature has grown partially because of that. Um, I don't know. One last question here. This is more of a rhetorical comment than a question. Uh, in my efforts uh, to evangelize the legacy of Winston Churchill among my friends who might share cigars and other things, I uh, have often uh, self-described Winston Churchill in this manner, and I would, I'm wondering if you as a professional historian would agree. I've told my colleagues, my friends, that in my mind, Winston 
Churchill was a brilliant meteor burning across the 20th century night sky, burning so hot he could not be ignored, and burning so brightly he could not be forgotten. In your opinion, is that an apt description of the great man? Uh, I, I actually think it is, it's a pretty good one. What, one, of the, one of the things that I, that I struggle with, and perhaps we all do as, as, as exponents of Winston Churchill, is we get our head wrapped around trying to make D D D Churchill contemporary and make Churchill relevant. And I, I taught a course at Westminster, I called it Churchill Man of Three Centuries. And it, and it began with the notion that Churchill is a dead white British Prime Minister. How irrelevant can that be to modern Americans? Um, and that's what I asked the students to begin. That was their first sort of thought piece. And I had uh, a young guy come up to me, an African-American football player, who knew little of history, knew nothing of Winston Churchill. But at the end of that course, he said, I was inspired by the man, by his resilience, by his determination. Although he lived in a very different time and a very different place and in a very different element of the social stratum, the qualities that Churchill embodied, and you alluded to some of them just then, stand beyond time. They stand out of time. So in a sense, Churchill is a historical figure, but what Churchill is emblematic of are some of the best qualities that human beings possess and that they are timeless. And so I try and remind myself to think about that. Churchill historical figure, yes, but what he's done and when he did it and how he did it are very much timeless. He, he is an inspiration to all who've ever had to struggle who've been knocked down and had to get up again, who've sometimes lacked the courage to stand up and say what they thought when everybody else disagreed with them. That's essentially what Churchill is in many ways. Great historical figure, but I think Churchill will live on beyond other historical figures because of that as much as anything. I'm not sure whether that answers the question, but anyway. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Havers. Though it is possibly uh, Churchill's best known post-war action that you've described, you've also shown us today that there is much to continuously learn and be inspired by with Winston's story. And so now we have a short break before us, before we begin our panel discussion. Please be back promptly at 2.15, 2.15, so that we can begin on time. Thank you.